Come home to Jesus. This is the message that Max Solbrecken has proclaimed for 50 years to multitudes across the world. His crusades have taken him to the Hindus of India, Muslims of Pakistan, Buddhists of Sri Lanka, voodoo worshippers of Haiti, Catholics of Malta, and headhunters of northern Luzon. He has preached God's Word in stadiums, churches, tents, universities, and prisons. He comes to you today with the message of God's love and power. The man who is not afraid to preach the truth, Pastor Max Solbrecken. I wish to turn to the book of Isaiah the prophet, the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. I'd like to read it a little bit from Isaiah and also from St. John's Gospel. Let's turn to Isaiah 53 and reading from verse number 1 as follows in Jesus' name. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty. We should desire him. When we see him hanging on the cross, there's nothing beautiful about him. I've heard preachers say that he was an ugly man, that he wasn't handsome, but it doesn't say that. It talks about Jesus dying on a cross, and when they looked upon him, they couldn't even stand to look upon him. He was so terrible. No calmness. We shall see him. There's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows. And acquainted with grief. We hid as it were our faces from him. We hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and esteemed. And surely he hath borne our griefs. Actually, in the original, it says, Surely he had borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord had laid upon him the iniquity of us all. It says he was oppressed and he was afflicted. And he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no evil, no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord. God was happy. God was thrilled. God was joyful. God the Father was so pleased when they bruised him. That tore me to pieces. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It was God who bruised him. It was God's will that he would, were to die. It says, please the Lord to bruise him, to put him to grief. Hallelujah. Some will say hallelujah. hallelujah. In John's Gospel, the 19th chapter, and verse number 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it's finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. Shall we pray? Pastor Jack, come on up here and lead us to the throne of grace, please. Father, on this Palm Sunday, we want to thank you for being the sacrificial lamb that came into this world to pay for our transgressions, to be bruised and to be stricken from life. We thank you, Father, for sending your Son to pay for our transgressions. Bless this 
congregation this morning and yes. make this, this truth real in each one of our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Slip up both of your hands and shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Let's remain standing, please. And let me turn to the book of First Peter. First Peter. I want to preach on the blood of Jesus today. Next Sunday, I'll preach on the resurrection. I'd like to speak on the blood of Christ. Nine profound truths about the blood of Christ. Reading from 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 18 as follows in Jesus' name. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood, and we'll say the precious blood, precious blood. but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who was verily ordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another, with a pure heart, fervently, being born again. Say born again. born again. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withereth, the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Shall we bow, please, for prayer? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for your anointing to come upon every man, woman, and child gathered here today. I pray that the Holy Spirit will come and find a lodging place in every heart, in every soul. I pray, Father, that you will heal those who are sick in their spirit, in their mind, in their soul, in their body. I pray, God, for those who will be watching this on on the YouTube, Lord, and on the radio. We pray for them. Cover us all with your precious blood now, for Christ's sake. And in Jesus' name, and everyone, please shout a great big amen. amen. Slip up your hand and shout hallelujah. hallelujah. And you may be seated. Christ has died. Christ, died. Christ is risen. Christ, is risen. Christ will come again. One more time. Christ has died. Christ, died. Christ is, risen. is risen. And Christ will come again. Will come again. You know... I was doing some research about Jesus Christ and uh, others who have claimed to be divine. Buddha never claimed to be divine. He was a teacher searching after truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Buddha was searching after truth. Jesus Christ said, I am the truth. Moses never claimed to be Jehovah. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Confucius never claimed to be holy. Jesus asked, who convinces me of sin? Muhammad said, unless Allah throws his cloak of mercy over me, I have no hope. Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Mahatma Gandhi said, of Jesus, he was a man who was completely innocent, offering himself as a sacrifice for the good of others, including his enemies, and became the ransom for the world. It was a perfect act, he says. It was more than an act. It was God revealing his love. It was God showing us how much he cared. It was Jesus dying for the sins of the world and rising from the dead. It was not an act. Jesus is, was, and always will be the son of the living God. Napoleon said, I know men 
And I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Jesus has been dead for hundreds of years. And yet there are a million men who would die for him. Napoleon Bonaparte died as a believer. Someone say hallelujah. In the scripture that I've read here, 1 Peter, we find here four great truths. The blood of Christ in verse 18 and 19 speaks of the Father in verse 21. Speaks about the Holy Spirit in verse 22. Verse 23 and 25, it speaks of the Word of God. It says here, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, by the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. This speaks about Jesus and his blood. The blood of Christ. And then we go down here to verse number 21. It says, who by him do believe in God. This is of God the Father. That raised him up from the dead. And gave him glory. That your faith and hope might be in God. So numbers, verse 18 and 19. It speaks of the blood of Christ. Verse number 21. Of the Father who said his son. Verse number 22. See, ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. Now it speaks of the Holy Spirit. Can you say hallelujah? Hallelujah. Unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart. Fervently. Say fervent. Fervent. Red hot. Love. And then we've Find verses 23 and 25. It speaks of the word of God. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God. Say the word of God. Which liveth and abideth forever. Verse 25. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which we, by the gospel, is preached unto you. So in this first chapter of Peter's epistle. You have four great truths in the first chapter. St. Peter talks about Jesus dying, shedding his blood, the blood of Christ. He speaks about God the Father who sent his Son and who raised him from the dead. He speaks of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The blessed Holy Spirit in verse 22. Seeing ye ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth Through the Spirit. It's by the Spirit that we are cleansed and kept by the Spirit. God leads us and guides us. And then number four, the Word of God. The Word of God. It says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth. Thank you. Abideth forever. I love the Word of God. How theologians can read this book and not believe, I don't understand. How preachers can stand up and preach the word of God in many churches and they don't know Christ. Dr. Charles S. Price was a great preacher of the gospel in the U.S. of A. He was a a congregational preacher. And Amy Semple McPherson was coming to his city in a great crusade. And someone said, Dr. Price, come some of his people said, you must hear this woman, preacher. You must hear her. So he went. And when she began to preach, Dr. Charles S. Price was sitting on the platform. And he felt conviction because he was unsaved. He was a theologian. He was a doctor of divinity. But yet he was not born again. And he walked down and knelt at the altar as this great woman preached. And Dr. Towner said, Dr. Price, the Baptist minister said, this is for sinners. He said, that's why I'm here. And he gave his heart to Christ. And he became that great preacher. 
probably one of the greatest preachers that have ever been in Canada. Dr. Charles S. Price in the 1920s. He packed out the largest places there were, thousands of people. Lauren Fox was a total cripple, and he was dying, and God healed him in that crusade and raised him up, and he became another great preacher like Charles S. Price. And one hundreds of thousands. But Charles S. Price was a Christian, so-called, but didn't know Jesus. I was in Norway. Donna and I had left Trinidad. We flew into London, England. We had not slept during the night. Donna was crocheting or knitting, and I was reading. We got to, to London, tired. We had lost eight hours. We had to wait for an hour or two, and we flew into Oslo, Norway. By this time, my eyes, I needed, almost needed toothpicks to hold them up. Stay awake. Three hours we sat in a vehicle, drove us up to a little place called Yailo, where we were having this conference. We were having services in the morning and in the evening, missions and miracles, and in the afternoon, skiing. A resort, people came from all over the world to, to ski at Yailo. We were sitting there waiting for our room to be ready. I was so tired, people were coming by me and saying, Hello, Pastor Max. Hello, Pastor Max. I said, oh, hello. All of a sudden, I heard the voice of God. He said, son. And I was awake. He said, see, see the man sitting over there? I said, yes. Total stranger. Go over to him right now and speak to him. I said, okay. I jumped to my feet, and as I walked over there, God gave me the message. I walked up to a total stranger. He looked like a professional person. Well dressed. Expensive luggage. About my size. Maybe a couple of years younger. I walked up to him and I said to him in Norwegian. May I have a word with you sir? He stood to his feet and he answered me in Swedish. We understand each other. He said yes. I said God spoke to me about you just now. He said, he did? What did he say? I said, God instructed me to ask you two questions. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And number two, have you ever experienced the Holy Spirit? And immediately he burst into tears. And I had to grab him because he was going to fall. And he stood there just crying and shaking all over. His teeth just shattering up and down and chattering. I held him right in the foyer of that hotel. People walking past us. He said, to, he said I, am a, I am a dentist. I'm from Sweden. He said, I came here for a week. I had to have a week off. I have 26 on my staff. And two years ago, it came into my heart. Not one of my... People working for me had a good life. There was death. There was divorce. There was sickness. Children on drugs. Not one of my, one of the, my employees had a good life. And I said, and I'm not a religious man, but I said, what can I do to help them? And the voice said to me, you can't do anything because you're not born again. You don't know Jesus. And you haven't, received, you haven't received the Holy Spirit. So immediately I got into my car and drove down to the Lutheran church. The state church. I said, Pastor, do you know Jesus? He said, no, I don't. Unfortunately, I don't. Have you ever received the Holy Spirit? No, unfortunately, I have not. But there is an evangelical church here. They say they know Jesus. They say they know the Holy Spirit. He said, I have searched for that church for two years. I haven't found it. Within seven minutes, I had one in the Christ. Within seven minutes, he was filled with the Spirit. He was 
teeth were just chattering and he was praising the Lord. We heard the intercom. Bus for Sweden leaving now. I said, that's my bus. He hugged me, grabbed his bags, and he ran to the landing. He put his bags down. He turned around with his arms in the air, and he shouted, Hallelujah! <laughs> and he took off into the bus to go back to talk to 26 people about Jesus. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about the blood of Jesus. I'm speaking about the word of God. And God the Father who sent his son and raised him from the dead. Nine profound truths about the blood of Christ. First of all, the blood of Jesus has purchased our salvation. Come with me, please, to the book of Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Someone say, hallelujah. hallelujah. Colossians 1, 13. 13 and 14. Who have delivered us from the power of darkness. God hath delivered us from the power of darkness. And hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. In whom we have redemption. Say, redemption. I didn't hear you. Through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. His blood has purchased our salvation. Ephesians chapter 1. Go with me, please, to verse number 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Romans chapter 5. Speaks about being justified by the blood of Christ. Romans 5, turn to me, please. Romans 5 and verse 8. Well, let's go to verse number 6. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man one, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that. Well, we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. He shed his blood for us. Salvation. He's pardoned us. First John chapter 1, verse 7. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood, say the blood. blood. Shout the blood. blood. Of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanseth us from all sins. Number two, his blood has defeated the devil. Turn me to Hebrews chapter 2. And let me read from verse number 14. For as much then as the children, that's us, are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject upon this. It says here that Christ for as much then as the children are part as the flesh and blood, Christ also himself took part of the same. That through death he might destroy that devil to deliver us. Say, Christ's death has destroyed the devil to deliver us. Say, Christ's victory, Satan's defeat, and our liberty. Shout, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. First John chapter 3, verse number 8. It says here, St. John shares it with us. This marvelous power of the Holy Spirit to deliver us. First John 3 and verse number 8. Precious Lord. It says here, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy. Say destroy. destroy. Shall destroy, destroy the works of the devil. If something is destroyed, you can't fix it. If something is destroyed, you can't fix it. Look at Acts chapter 10, verse 38, how that God 
anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost, with power, who went about doing good and healing all. Say, healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. The blood of Christ has defeated the devil and taken away from him his power over the human race. Number three, his blood has reconciled all to himself. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 20. This marvelous scripture here. Colossians 1 and 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross. Say peace. Say voito. Say roha. Roha, that's finish. That's peace. Say roha. Shout roha. Say peace. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, I am to reconcile all things unto himself by him. I say whether there be things in earth or things in heaven. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile, to reconcile us to himself. Only St. Paul uses that word, reconciliation. Only St. Paul understood more than anyone else about the reconciliation. God sent his son to reconcile us to himself. We were enemies of God. God was against us. God could have never loved us if Christ hadn't have come and paid for our sins and brought us to the Father. Say the blood. So he has purchased our salvation. He has defeated the devil. And he has reconciled all things unto himself. In Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I feel like I'm preaching now at a, at a uh, Bible college seminary. Are you listening? Are you listening? In the book of. Let's turn to Hebrews 10 and verse number 12. Hebrews 10 and 12. But this man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Who is this man? Jesus. But this man, after he'd offered one sacrifice, only one sacrifice, you don't need to offer him again and again and again like the Roman Catholics do. In their mass, he was offered once. But this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Number four, his blood has made an end of sin. Say an end of sin. The ninth chapter of Hebrews, verse 26. Watch this now. For then must he often have been suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away, say put away, put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He has destroyed sin. He puts it away. He has conquered all sin, every sin you've committed. He will forgive you because he's paid for all. He's put away sins by one sacrifice. Someone say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. All things become new. Number five. His blood has satisfied the demand of divine justice for our sins. Through his propitiation. Hebrews 9 and 15. Look at verse number 15. And for this cause. He is the mediator. Of the New Testament. That by means of death. For redemption. For the redemption of the transgressions. That were under the first testament. 
that they are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Precious Jesus. Look at 1 John. He talks about this marvelous word, propitiation. In the book of 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 2. And he is the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation means the satisfaction. His blood, his death satisfied Almighty God. His blood is the covering, the mercy seat, the expiation. One had to die. A perfect one. Every Passover in Jerusalem, the high priest would stand there and he would shout, let one innocent come. Let one innocent come and make an atonement for the guilty. But there was no innocent one until Jesus came. He was the innocent one. Someone shout hallelujah. I don't know why. Is this gripping you? Does it grab you? Is this touching your heart? And look at what it says here in verse 26 of Hebrews 7. For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. This is the one, the innocent one. And John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Let one innocent come and make an atonement for the guilty. They knew they were guilty. But nobody could come and do it. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then all of a sudden, he came. And they rejected him. Look at Romans, the third chapter. William Cowper lived in London, England. He was always melancholy. He was always trying to kill himself. He believed the gospel, but he couldn't believe that God loved him. He couldn't believe that he could be saved. He couldn't make the connection. One day he took a glass of hemlock, poison, lifted it to his lips, but he, his hand shook. His lip quivered and he dropped the glass and it hit the floor. Broke into many pieces. He picked up a revolver and put it to his head. But he couldn't pull the trigger. He threw it down. He ran out into the streets. Ran over, over on the bridge over the river Thames in London. To throw himself into the water. But he was restrained, he said. Strangely restrained. He couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. He went home and he hung himself. But somebody came and cut him down. They sent him to the insane asylum. St. Albans Asylum in London. And one day he picked up the Bible and read Romans. Three and 25, whom God has set forth to be, a, to be a propitiation, a covering, a satisfaction through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. All of a sudden, a light came on. Now he saw it. Jesus had paid it all for him. It was Jesus who was the covering. He was the mercy seat. It was Jesus who was the expiation who had to die. So his death, his death covered him. And all of a sudden he said, I couldn't believe it. I was so happy. He said, if God's almighty arm wasn't under me, I don't know what would have happened to me. He was free. He wrote the song, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. The sinners plunged beneath the flood 
who saw their guilty stains, the dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain this day, and they may I, the Father, see, wash all my sins away. There is a fountain <laughs> filled with blood. Hallelujah. God the Father was satisfied with the work of Jesus. Number six, his blood cleansed heaven itself. Did you know that heaven had to be cleansed? That's what it says in Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Why did heaven have to be cleansed? Because there was a battle in heaven. Lucifer had caused a terrible thing in heaven. Come with me to the book of Hebrews. And let me read it to you. Precious Jesus, hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens, the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifice than these. He had to go cleanse heaven. When he arose, he carried his blood into the Holy of Holies, and heaven was cleansed. Why did heaven have to be cleansed? Well, we find in Revelation. Why? Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought with his angels and prevailed not. Neither was the place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan. Which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth. He had caused this terrible war in heaven. And the Bible says in Job, the fourth chapter, the Bible tells us in Job, the fourth chapter, about this. Job chapter 4, verse 18. Behold, he put no trust in his servants and his angels. He charged with folly. God charged his angels with folly. And they were Cast out of heaven. And Jesus brought his own blood to cleanse heaven. I saw that. I said, my God. Oh. That's not all, but number seven, his blood guarantees our eternal salvation. Can you wonder? You die, yes, Christ is your Savior. But what will happen a million years from now? Will he still be your Savior? People say there's no Jesus. If there'd been no Jesus, if there's no Jesus, we wouldn't be here. There'd be no world. Because he causes the world to exist. He looks after everything. He made the worlds. He watches over the worlds. And he will be with us forever. Someone shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 9. I'm going to close in a little while, but I've got to give you these tremendous truths that keep me up at night, that put, keep me in the Word of God for hours, and I can't lay it down. <laughs> so we'll see. <laughs> they say a grown man shouldn't cry. I never cried, really, until Jesus touched me. I thought it was too tough to cry. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal, eternal redemption. Can you shout eternal? Eternal redemption for us. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. It says, Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth. He ever liveth. That gives me a lot of hope, a lot of faith. He, is, he lives forever. Why? He ever liveth. What? Why is he alive now? To make intercession. He, his job is to intercede for you and for me. He ever liveth to play 
game is to have a good time. No, to intercede. He is even now before the throne of God interceding for you and for me. Forever. Forever. Some will say hallelujah. Number eight. I'm almost finished. His blood opened the gates of Hades for him. Hebrews 13. In the King James Version, some of the places where it says hell should be Hades. There's some mistranslations there about hell. In the Norwegian Bible, it doesn't say that. In a lot of other English Bibles. Jesus did not go to hell. He went to Hades. The righteous place in the part of Hades reserved at that time for the righteous dead. The 13th chapter, verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead the Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Everlasting covenant. Oh. Glory to God. Lift up both of your hands. Say praise the Lord. I'm going to close. His blood opened heaven for Jesus to enter. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead, going back, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, he was raised from the dead by his own blood. His own blood raised him. And his own blood opened heaven for him. It's in Hebrews 9 and verse 12. It says here, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place. Having obtained eternal redemption for us, his blood opened heaven's gates for him. And there's one more thing I want to share from Psalm 24. Let me go to Psalm 24, please. You know, Psalm 22 is about the dying shepherd. Psalm 23 is the good shepherd. Psalm 24 is the reigning shepherd, the coming shepherd. And in the 24th Psalm, see what it says here. Verse 7, lift up your hands, O ye gates, and be ye lift up ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts is the King of glory. What is this speaking about? This is speaking about Christ having risen from the dead. He carries with him the captive souls from Hades. And now he is on his way up. He says to Mary, don't touch me till I've, till I've ascended to my Father and my God. He carried his blood and he ascended. And as he was ascending, he shouted, open the gates. And someone says, who is this? Open the gates so the king of glory can come in. And the guard says, who is the king of glory? He says, the Lord mighty in battle. He is the king of glory. They still didn't open the gates. Open the gates. So the king of glory can come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord mighty in battle. And the gates were open. He swept into the gates into heaven. Someone shout hallelujah. hallelujah. One more truth I want to share with you. When I was first filled with the Spirit, I heard Pentecostals saying, I, everywhere they went, I was a Lutheran, I never heard it before. And they were saying, the Spirit answers to the blood. The Spirit answers to the blood. What are they talking about? The Spirit answers to the blood. The old Pentecostals, they knew something. Today, not many people know it. Hebrews 9 and 14. Here it is. 
how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purging your conscience to serve the living God. I have found wherever they preach the blood of Christ, miracles happen. Wherever they don't preach the blood of Christ, there are no miracles. The Holy Spirit answers to the blood because I've preached on the blood now. The Holy Spirit will do miracles. He works through the blood. He works through the blood of Christ. I believe that when Jesus died, the Holy Spirit was in him when he died. St. Paul said that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. At that very moment when Christ died, he had the Holy Spirit. God the Father had to turn his back on his son to judge him, but God the Holy Spirit was in Jesus. Reconciling the world. I believe that when Jesus died, the Holy Spirit took that blood. The Holy Spirit was there, guarding his body in the tomb, his blood, so it would not corrupt. And when Christ arose from the dead, the Holy Spirit said, Here, here's your blood, carry it into the Holy of Holies. Power of the blood. I could share more about that, but I don't have time now. I want to say one thing. As I was coming here, I was reminded I had just come back from overseas. It was in 1966. We had spent three and a half months away from my beautiful wife and children. And Tommy Tatika was with me. He had left his wife, Irene, and the children. We had three and a half months overseas. We lived in White Rock, British Columbia. My office was on the King George Highway. I just got back. I was on radio all the time. We had a lot of mail. We had a staff there looking after the mail. My wife was there. On my desk, there were a lot of personal things I should look after. Something that you would write to me, don't tell anybody about this. Keep this personal. And I would answer them. Because sometimes people spread things that they shouldn't spread. So when people would come to me and tell me personal things, I wouldn't tell it to anybody else. I'd take it to Jesus. Can you say amen? And all of a sudden I got a call. Bob Rosen from Regina had come. He and his wife, Ella, they were going to visit her mother in the hospital in New Westminster. He said, Brother Max, you're back from India. I said, yes. He said, Ella and I are here. Could you come down to visit Ella's mother? I could have said I have a thousand things to do. Holy Spirit said, go immediately. I said, Bob, I'll be there in 20 minutes. I ran out to my automobile, drove down to New Westminster. Across the Patula Bridge. It was an old independent hospital. Bob was waiting for me. I said, Bob, I can go to any hospital, general hospital, and without asking permission, I can go and visit somebody as a minister. But this is a private hospital. I feel I should ask permission. He said, okay. We walked in, a nurse approached me approached us. And all of a sudden, I heard myself saying, could I speak with the matron, please? I don't know why I said it. She said, of course. The matron walked up to me, and I said, excuse me, but my name is Max Solberg, and I'm a preacher of the gospel. This is Bob Rosen. His mother-in-law is here. It's a private hospital. I wanted permission. She said, oh, brother Max, you're back from India. And I said, yes. She said, don't you remember me? I'm Sister Brown. I helped send you to India. 
one of our supporters, I said, please forgive me. Under all that, you know, that hat and all that, you know, the way they used to dress nurses up, I didn't recognize her. She said, Brother Max, of course you can visit her, but would you do a favor for me? And I said, of course I will. In the south end of this hospital is a woman who's dying. She's very aged. And she's a very strong Roman Catholic. She will die anytime. Would you go there and win her for Christ? But be very careful. She's a very strong Catholic. I said, okay, I'll do my best. So we walked down that long corridor. I opened the door. And this very aged woman, frail, was lying there. I said, excuse me, but... And she said, I said, excuse me, but I am a man of God. She said, wait, don't say another word. I know who you are. I said, how could you know who I am? She said, please come, draw near. So I did. She said, I've been a strong Catholic all my life. I've never missed Mass. Every morning I've taken Mass. And here, communion. She said, I thought I was ready to die. But three days ago, something told me, you're going to die. And all of a sudden, a fear came into my heart. I wasn't ready. I told the priest. Nothing happened. She said, I have been praying for three days. I haven't slept. Last night, I got so tired, I fell asleep. And I had a dream. And God spoke to me and said, tomorrow a man of God will come to you. Show you the way of salvation. She said, I've been waiting all day for you. I fell to my knees. I was crying like a baby. Bob was shaking, shivering with tears, teeth chattering. A letter to Christ. She said, oh, I see it now. Yes, of course I see it, Yes. It's not the church. It's not the Pope. It's Jesus, isn't it? I said, yes. Yes, she said, I believe it. And I laid her in a sinner's prayer. And when I was finished, I said, you're saved. She said, oh, yes, I know it. And I'm not afraid anymore. And she said, would you bring the wastebasket over here? Put it down over here. And then with her arm, she pushed all those Catholic books and rosaries. I said, I won't need this anymore. Would you please get me a Bible? I said, I will. That afternoon, we sent a giant print Bible by a special courier. Ten days later, we heard that she was gone. Sister Brown called me. She said, Pastor Max, our dear sister, she's gone. She said, the doctor told me this morning, Mrs. So-and-so will, will die today. You're the matron. You've got to ask her. Does she want a priest? It's your duty. She says, of course I will ask her. So she walked in. She says, I walked in. And I said, I know, sister, you've given your heart to Christ. I know we've had 10 days of joyous times with God. But I have to ask you, do you want a Roman Catholic priest to give you absolution? She said, oh, no. Oh, no. I don't need a priest. I have Jesus now. <laughs> and she laid back on the pillow. And she was gone. For 50 years, Pastor Max Solbrecken has awakened the conscience of his audiences through the anointed proclamation of the claims of Christ, who said, no man can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon. The truth is, you are either for him or against him. You cannot remain neutral. Great costs are involved in spreading of Christ's gospel. Please consider investing in this ministry. Contact Max Solbrecken at MSWM, Box 44220, RPO, Garside, Edmonton, Alberta, T5V1N6, Canada.
You have been watching the Come Home to Jesus television ministry with Canada's preacher man, Dr. Max Solbrecken, who has proclaimed the Word of God across the world for 50 years without fear or favor of man or devil. Ask for Canada's revival magazine, The Cry of His Coming, when you write. Invest in souls by supporting this end time ministry. Please contact Max Solbrecken at MSWM Box 44220, RPO Garside, Edmonton, Alberta, T5V1N6, Canada. Oh, die